I think one of the advantages of being a, a smaller church, a fun-sized church, a bite-sized church, a travel-sized church, is, you know, something could go wrong and so what? <laughs> right? I mean, it's so relaxed. It's just so much better. It's just so much better. I, I wasn't always in that situation where something like that had happened. It would have been a disaster. Yep. And we just sang until the music came back up. We're good. We are continuing in our series in Matthew. We are in, in Matthew 19, and our series is The Road to Triumph, where Jesus is preparing his men for something they didn't want to believe was going to happen. He'd been telling them that he was going to Jerusalem, he had to suffer, he was going to be crucified, and as I've said before, that's when they stopped listening. They just, they just couldn't hear it anymore, and we can't blame them, right? I mean... Here's somebody that they knew was the Messiah. They understood this. In the last section we looked at, Matthew, Jesus spends a lot of time and a lot of energy into building up their faith so that it's stable. And as soon as it's stable, it's not going to it's not going to rock. It's standing there. It's solid. Then he tells them, "I'm going to be crucified." I mean, how would you how would you get that down? We have to put ourselves in in the, these very human men in their shoes, and this would be a hard thing to, to, to take in. But they're steady, they're stable, and they're staying there. And he, he moves on, he begins to talk about different things, and, and one of the questions that comes up, and he's, this is sort of a continuing part of this chunk that Matthew uh, gifted us with, that he's talking about greatness in the kingdom. And who, who, is, who is great? You know, they're not, they're not asking a rebellious question. They're asking, well, if... If, if you're going to pay the temple tax like everybody else, but you're the one that owns the temple, why, you know, how does authority work here? What, what is greatness here? He begins to ask, them, who is the greatest in the kingdom then? Who's in charge here? It's another way we could put it. It's really what they're asking. And he brings a child and sets him. You remember this? He brings a child and sets him in front of them. And he says, unless you become converted and become like this child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. It's really very simple. But he goes on to say that greatness in the kingdom is defined by people who will take off their, their, their high and mightiness and they will step off their, their platform and get down with the kids. They're willing to, 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 to kneel down with anybody else that needs, needs their attention. That's greatness. Why is that greatness? Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He came down out of heaven. He knelt down to be with the rest of us. He took on the form of a real man and died for our sin and loved us. It's an amazing thing. And so as he's going through all of this, he's going through all of this, he's defining for these men what the kingdom is going to be like once the crucifixion and the resurrection, which he told them about too, he would be raised after three days, but they weren't taking that part in yet. And so once he, once he has that there, once, once he's... Once they see that, they're going to understand an awful lot of these things. But he's setting up right now really what salvation is about, and he's clarifying something. Because in a, in a few days, um, maybe a few weeks, I'm not sure exactly the timeline of when this event took place. It's not real clear. That doesn't really matter. But very soon, he's going to be entering Jerusalem. And the first thing he did, did when he goes into Jerusalem is he cleansed the temple, right? Because the sacrificial system was so confused after decades and decades, centuries and centuries of, of not understanding how salvation works. It had been very, very confused. And so this is a very important story that we're going to look at today. And Jesus meets a man. Actually, someone comes up to him. And he's, he's a very interesting guy. He's not, he's not so different from us. In fact, one of the things I, I, I was going to title this is just another American, because this guy is so much like us. Anyway, uh, picking up in verse, in verse uh, 16 of, of Matthew 19. We meet this guy. He's rich. He's influential. He has a good life. But something's missing. And what's missing is he's got the wrong idea about something, and it's messing up everything downstream from him. And someone came and said to him, Teacher, what good thing shall I do to obtain eternal life? Now, Mark says to this man, or Mark describes, the Gospel of Mark describes this man and says he comes and he kneels down before Jesus. Now, now, 
for whatever reason, Matthew leaves that detail out, and he says, good teacher, he calls him. And so Matthew's leaving that out, and I think there's a reason for that. He says, teacher, what, what's the next word? Good thing shall I do. He's asking, how do I get myself into heaven? That's what he's asking. See, we talk a lot about grace. We talk about we're saved by grace uh, through faith alone, and there's, there's nothing else that, that we'll, we'll do. God is not asking us to do anything. What could we possibly do that would, that would uh, cover our sin, that would remove our sin? What could we possibly offer him that isn't already contaminated by sin anyway? All of the universe is under the curse because of the fall. There's nothing here holy to say, here's something heavenly that you could have that we would, we would buy our souls with. There's nothing. But this guy knows something's missing. But he comes and he says, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he means business. We don't see it described in Matthew, but in Mark and Luke, he comes and kneels down before Jesus. He's, he's, he means business. He's not here for show. He's not, what good thing shall I do? He's not, he's not some erudite, educated, powerful man, although he is all of that. He certainly doesn't present himself that way. This is a, this is a ruler. He probably comes from an aristocratic family. He's got influence. He's probably educated. And in those days, they had pretty good education, believe it or not. Who knows how many languages this guy had under his belt? That was very common. I don't know if he did or not, but I don't think it's, it's outrageous. We know Paul had three or four he was educated. We know the apostles had at least two, probably three, maybe four. So they would have had smatterings of Hebrew. They would have probably spoken Aramaic in the street. They wrote very good Greek. They communicated with the Romans in Latin. <laughs> and we think these are ignorant fishermen. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> Even today, Jewish guys have typically, on the average, two years more college than anybody else in the society. Ashkenazi Jews have an IQ of 115. That's their average. <laughs> Wait till they get going. So anyway, so these are smart people. And this guy comes up and he puts himself at Jesus' feet. He means business. He's not kidding. And he has this question. Now, we call him the rich young ruler. I, I was looking through the text, and I don't see where he's called young. So maybe he is, maybe he isn't, you know, tradition. Maybe that's not an important point. We'll flex and move on. But they don't, agree, they don't, recur, uh, they don't re refer to him as young. Maybe, maybe he had a long life to look back on because he's asking some pretty serious questions. You know, I, I could see a 20-something might come up with these questions, but I'm more inclined to think someone with a, a few gray hairs is asking this question. Because you come to a place where you look back in your life and you're going, really, is this all there is? Something missing here. Something missing here. Is this part of the story I don't have? What do I need to know? And he's heard about Jesus, and he just comes out of the dark, just kind of steps out of the shadows, and he's right there, and the words I want to put into his mouth is, is, we talk about grace, we seem to understand grace, and the words I'd put in this man's mouth is, yeah, yeah, I know about grace, but really, what do I do? Have you ever asked that question? There's an awful lot of confusion out there about how we are actually saved and how it is we function in our Christian life. It's, yeah, 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 uh, yeah he, he accepts us by grace, blah, 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 but, but what do I really do? And there are groups out there that teach that, yes, Jesus died for our sin. He paid for our sin. Yes, yes, yes. But now you have to finish the, the course or you don't get in. So they're really saving themselves. And there's denominations out there, Christian denominations that teach, well, yes, but if you, if you sin too much or you, you turn your heart away from God, well, how, how would you possibly do that? You must be born again. How, much, how would you possibly do that? He takes your old life out, crucifies it, buries it, raises it to newness of life in him. He exchanges the life that you had from Adam with his own life in its place. How could you possibly turn away now? We are slaves of righteousness. No longer are we slaves to the flesh, to sin. 
It doesn't mean necessarily we live perfectly holy, godly lives. But, you know, that's why Hebrews 12 kicks in, and God is not afraid to pull you through a knot hole to scrape that pattern off your sorry hide. You know? <laughs> I mean, think about this. Jesus, Jesus is a pretty extreme personality. He loves you in ways we can't even put words to. I love that, that phrase, an ineffable. It means something that, that you can't put words to. You can't. You can't speak enough to, to make it clear and explain. And so he loves us like that. He's not afraid to die on the cross. He's not afraid to send someone to hell. Is he going to be afraid to pull you through a knothole? Probably not. That seems like a little easier thing to do, doesn't it? Okay, just say it. Just say it. But what this guy believes then is, is that he has to do something. And he's completely confused, but of course he is, because that's the culture he's coming from. It's all about works. It's all about obedience. It's all about performance. And so he asks this question, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? It's an honest question. We shouldn't criticize this guy. He's honest. He's serious. He's on his knees. And Mark and Luke say, good teacher. What we're looking at here is this issue of workspace religion and, and workspace salvation. And A.W. Pink, in his excellent little monograph, um, A.W. Pink was a writer back around um, the turn of, of the 20th century, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s, World War I-ish. And he wrote some amazing stuff. I've been really impressed. I'm only recently getting to know him, but he's obviously been around for a while, I've, almost as long as I have. And the, go- and the gospel of <laughs> and he talks about in his little book, he calls it the gospel of Satan. And he makes some amazing, amazing observations. That, that, now, just on the surface, knowing what we know about this man, would you be nervous about having that guy as your neighbor? Do you think he'd be a good neighbor? I think he'd be a good neighbor. He's probably a really decent man. He's certainly trying hard. I'm not seeing a lot of ego there. He's a decent man. I wouldn't be afraid to have him buy the house next door to me. But this is, this is the deception of a works-based religion. Pink, Pink declares in this excellent quote, he says, The gospel of Satan is not a system of revolutionary principles, nor yet a program of anarchy. It does not promote strife and war, but aims at peace and unity. It seems not to set the mother against her daughter nor the father against her son, but fosters the fraternal spirit whereby the human race is regarded as one great brotherhood. It does not seek to drag down the natural man, but to improve and uplift him. It advocates education and cultivation and appeals to the best that is within us. It aims to make this world such a congenial and comfortable habitat that Christ's absence from it will not be felt and God will not be needed. It endeavors to occupy man so much with this world that he has no time or inclination to think of the world to come. It propagates principles of self-sacrifice, charity, benevolence, and teaches us to live for the good of others and to be kind to all. It appeals strongly to the carnal mind and is popular with the masses because it ignores the solemn fact that by nature man is a fallen creature, alienated from the life of God, and dead in trespasses and sins, and that his only hope lies in being born again. This is the satanic gospel. It is a counterfeit. He fakes it. No, 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 you don't need all of that. Just be a good person. What good thing can you do? That will earn your salvation. Well, they're, they're good people, and indeed they are. I was talking with uh, one of our uh, new faces today, and it was a pleasant conversation. He, he raised this, this idea of social justice. Have you ever heard that? It's actually a Marxist term. <laughs> That's scary. And he mentions in here, it's interesting, he used this word. It talks about uh, the large groups of population we call the masses. You know that idea actually comes out of, out of chemistry and physics? and was applied to a, gl- a group of people like as if they were a bunch of things, not real people. It is just a, a large bunch of it, a mass of them. It is, it's seeking to erase their personhood. But 
This idea is that we are to be, we are to be so good that we don't need to be saved. This is a terrifying thought. But then we have to ask the question, well, then how do we do that? And this man had been thinking along these ways. He's humble. He's educated. He has influence. I mean, I've said this, right? He's, he's, he's showing up at the feet of Jesus. We wouldn't be afraid to have this guy as a neighbor. He's probably a great neighbor. But he's asking this question, what must I do to be saved? What good work must I do? Tell me the good thing I have to do. And we get really confused. We get really confused because we think that we think that somehow if I do a bunch of good things then God is going to be pleased with me. And I will tell you this. I went, I had gone through Bible school because vocational Christians are, are obviously better Christians. Have you seen them on TV? Don't, don't go there. And so vocational Christians are somehow superior. I went to seminary because Bible school was good, but, you know, seminary, it's the next level. So I, I went there too. I went to the mission field. My wife and I served in Budapest, Hungary for six years. Why did I go there? Because I was trying to get God to like me. That is not a good reason to go to the mission field, let me tell you. So if that's what your plan is, just don't. Just don't. Go to Walmart, get something tasty, and come home. Because just save yourself the trip. But I was in a similar boat. Now, this, is, this gentleman's a little bit different. I, I don't doubt that I had salvation at the time. But we look as if we're supposed to please God by our good behavior. And we've misunderstood and we treat, we treat the gospel and we treat God as if it's this transactional relationship. I do for you and you will do for me. If I behave this way and I, I believe that way, then you will give me this, these things. And we treat God like this, as if he's this cosmic genie. Our relationship with God is an attachment. You might have heard that term. It is an attachment. It is not, it is not a transactional contract. He simply loves us. Well, how much is enough love? Well, how much do you love your kids? What are you not willing to sacrifice for your kids? And a lot of us have grown kids, right? A lot of you guys have grown kids? Yeah, what would you not lay down for them? It doesn't, it, that's a stupid question. The better question is, well, what do you need? Here it comes. Right? It's not a transactional relationship. Well, if you, kid, if you're really, if you're really nice to me, pay attention. If you're really nice to me, then, uh, then I'll give you all these good things. And there are people that approach God this way. Well, if I'm just pious enough, if, if, I, if I have enough faith, whatever that means, how do you measure that? If I have, when, when is enough? How do I know enough is? And, and so if I just have enough, then, then he will give me, he will give me this, the spirit. He will give me this blessing. He will give me material things. He will, it's, it's transactional. And underneath it all is we're playing footsie with something so powerful we really don't understand how dangerous it is. We are playing footsie with this artificial salvation and acceptance by God through good works. And it poisons the rest of our Christian life. Because we can never be sure, like this young man, we can never, be, and if indeed he is young, we can never be sure when is enough enough. You see the problem there? When is enough enough? God is holy. He dwells in heaven. What does he want that I have? When is enough enough? And so this guy shows up, same as we would, with a question. But he's been deceived. In Matthew 7, it talks about there's this broad way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. There's a narrow gate that leads to salvation, and only few go, with it, go in that way. Just a handful. So Jesus asked him a question. And he said to him, and he declared, and it's just, Jesus is so smart. And, you know, I've said this before, but, you know, being a therapist myself, Jesus is a pretty good therapist. Jesus is a pretty good therapist. Watch what he does here. And he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? Why did he ask? It's, 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 it's a leading kind of question, isn't it? It makes this man think, why did you come to me? What do you think I have? Clearly, this man is coming to Jesus as some kind of authority. 
And as you may know, some of you may know how the story plays out. There's a reason this man needs to think about this. Do you really want to know what I have to say? If I tell you what you want to know, are you going to trust me? Why are you calling me good? And he clarifies. Why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, and he tells him, keep the commandments. Do you really want to know? Are you, are, you are you asking me? Are you really asking me? Yeah, I guess I'm asking you. Then if I tell you, will you go, will you go along with this? Are you going to listen? So now Jesus has framed the discussion. You're coming to me, the one with authority. You're bowed down in front of me. I will absolutely help you, just the same as I would help the leper. No different. Keep the commandments. So he's asked what good thing. Keep the commandments. See, what Jesus is doing here is he's letting him reveal his own spiritual condition to himself. Because really, when it comes down to it, how did this man answer this question? Do you really want to know what I have to say? How did that man really answer the question? Do you know the rest of the story? He didn't really want to know. He wanted to stay with what good thing must I do to save myself. But Jesus says to him, keep the commandments. And you know, Moses did say, look at, look at Deuteronomy. You remember Deuteronomy? Way back in the books of Moses. Front party Bible. I'll tell you what page I'm on, but I wouldn't help you much. <laughs> Picking up with verse, verse 15. Deuteronomy 30. I should tell you the chapter. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. He says, I'll give you a second. He says, see, I have set, this is Moses speaking to um, the people just before they enter the promised land. Now, Deuteronomy is a series of sermons by Moses. Did you know that? It's a series of sermons by Moses to the people before they enter the land. And he's got some very important things that they need to think about. It's a second review of the law. This is what Deuteronomy means. And so he says this to them. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you where? In the land where you're entering to possess it. He's not really talking about heaven. It's a picture of it. But in heaven, there will be no sin. His holiness will be written on our hearts. There will be no temptation, no Satan, no downward pressure. Can you hear that? The walls of Jericho are about to come down. <laughs> I told you. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that you may live and multiply, that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess it. But if your heart turns away, and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse, so choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice, and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. <coughs> so Moses said this, keep the, land and you will, keep the law and you will live. So we can see why there might be some confusion, but he prefaced that before he says, keep the law and you will live and obey him and you will live. He says, love the Lord your God. He says that first. It's relationship. It's not transactional. So this young man then, he's thinking, he's listening. He's halfway there. You think about it, this guy is standing right on the edge of eternity. His toes are, are touching eternity. And he says to, the, to Jesus, which ones? Really? 
I mean, he's up to this in, to his eyeballs. Can you see it? Which ones? He's really confused. He's been working hard. This is, this is a good guy. This is a man of integrity, of character. But he doesn't understand God. Which ones? What a sad question. But that's why he's there. Because he knows that hasn't worked. And here's Jesus telling him the same thing he's heard his whole life. Keep the commandments. Be a good boy. Obey. Do this, do that. Sacrifice. Give of yourself. Which ones? Now Jesus says this. He says, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. Are these particularly hard? I mean, it, maybe I shouldn't ask because I know what the statute of limitations says. Any of you guys killed anybody? Maybe I shouldn't ask that. So you don't have to answer that if you don't want to. I'm a mandatory reporter, you know, so maybe you shouldn't just you tell me that. But <clears throat> you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And the next, the next one isn't really, a, isn't really one of the ten. The others are, but this one isn't. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why do you throw that in there? You notice which one is, is, is painfully missing here? Which one is missing? The first one. What's the first commandment? You shall love the Lord your God. With, right? Okay. I'm sorry. The first, I'm, I just totally blew that. Because I'm so used to saying it that way. The first commandment is, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God before me. Right? I'm it. Is there any difference between that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Is there any difference, really? Functionally, there's no difference. And so here's what he's doing. He's, he's pulling this man out. You've done all of these good things, but they are earthly things. Now, if we look at the commandments, there are there are two parts to the Ten Commandments. Have you noticed that? We've talked about this once in a while. There's the first four commandments and then the second six. The first four are all about your relationship with God. Have you noticed that? I am the Lord your God. You should have no other gods besides me, right? And the second one is what? No graven images, right? You're not going to make anything in heaven and earth and bow down and worship a graven image. Now, that, that includes the one that you would, you would label as, this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. None of that, because it distorts him. There's nothing in earth, there's nothing in creation that we could prop up and say, this is what God is like. There's nothing big enough. But it goes on farther, we are not to worship any other false God. Okay? So, basically, he's saying, I'm the Lord your God, don't have any other gods, don't distort me, and don't stray in worshiping anybody else. What's the next one? Do not take the Lord's name in vain. This does not mean you can't swear. There's other things, you know, good character, we don't need to do that. But that's not what that's talking about. It's not saying we, should, we shouldn't say God is a cuss word. Of course we shouldn't. If we were, then we've already violated the first one. You with me on that? What this is, is you don't falsely label yourself as a believer when you're not. Do not take... Stamp yourself with the name of the Lord your God when you're not really there. And then it follows up and says, for the Lord will not leave unpunished those who take his name in vain. Why does he say that? Don't pretend you're a believer when you're not. It won't work. That's the Dave Lucer translation. He sees it. He's not fooled. So this is about our relationship with God. So there's only one God. You go with him. You don't distort him and you don't worship other gods and you don't pretend you're a believer when you're not. And then the fourth commandment is the Sabbath. Why the Sabbath? Because it's about works-based salvation. God completed all his works in completing, including salvation. And how are we saved? By, gay, by faith, through grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. You with me on this? So these four first commandments are about our relationship with God. It's not transactional. It's just point of fact. You with me on this? Okay. Then the next six commandments are about how we treat people. Now Jesus left that whole first chunk off, didn't he? 
You know, you shall honor your father and mother. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not, uh, do not murder. Don't covet. All those things. Because all of those are about loving the Lord your God. Because it's his image. Men and women, boys and girls, are in his image. This is why when James says, if you have broken any one of the commandments, you can keep all the others, but if you've broken any one of the commandments, you're guilty of the whole thing. Because it's all about his image. Are you with me on this? This is kind of heady stuff. Yes? Okay, okay. Like I can see the wheels turning. I'm just not sure what you're grinding in there, okay? Is this guy nuts up there? Is, he, is this getting complicated? No, really. So he says, which ones? What does that tell you? He doesn't understand the basics of his relationship with God. He doesn't get it. Because when Jesus was asked in Matthew 22, he was asked by a lawyer, which I think is really interesting. And why don't you grab your Bible, look at that real quick. Come on, Dave. Yes. Matthew chapter 22 and I've referenced this so many times, I don't have anything left to preach on when we finally get to it. I thought that was funny. Matthew 22. <laughs> Let's pick up 22, verse 35. Not 34. 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, I'll bet they loved that. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer. Now, uh, our friend Dave, the exemption, I think it's very funny that this guy's at, a, a lawyer is asking this question. It's a lawyer that asks this. And his question is this. He's testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? As if he knows. He thinks he knows. He thinks he knows. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Of course, of course the lawyer is going to ask that question. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He's quoting out of Leviticus. And this is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. He goes on. The lawyer didn't ask this. Jesus is volunteering this. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on to say a, a thing that should have gone off like a bomb, like a roll of thunder all across those hills. And he says, on these two commandments depend the whole on the prophets. So the first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, strength, everything that you are. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbors yourself. Click. Everything that God is asking is of us is contained in those two concepts. Everything that Scripture talks about stands upon this idea. Everything that God asks of us, love him, love your neighbor. He didn't get this because the false gospel, the gospel of works, leaves that first chunk out. One way or another, they leave it out every time because they will exclude a clear picture of Jesus. They'll substitute a false Jesus. So it sounds like they're talking about God when they're not. They'll be talking about some philosopher or some prophet or some, some, some God consciousness or, or some cosmic putty that makes everything up. This is what pantheism does. So they substitute a false God in the place of a real relationship with the living God. I think you've heard me say this, that I was with a, a, a group of, shall we say, theologians, was a bunch of elders at the church and, uh, and several pastors, who all of whom were well-educated. And I asked them this question. I said, you know, we talk about all of our attributes, all of the attributes of God. We talk about them, and there's lists of them, and there's books written on each one of them. And so which, which attributes do we come up with? Because there's one we leave out. And they, well, God is holy, and God is loving, and God is just, and he's free, and, and he's righteous, and all these things that we talk about, right? We know those. You could come up with a similar list. And I said, but you're missing one. What do you mean? The living God. He's living. He's not a concept. He is a person. And we have a relationship with him. And then he created man in his image. And if we love him, we will love them. But it's not transactional. If we do this, it's because we love him. 
It's not because we're earning our salvation. It's because this is just how things are. So he says all these things. But the young man said to him, I mean, I can almost see him on his knees. I I wonder if he's starting to weep at this point. That's what I imagine. You know, turn your mental TV on, see this man. He, He hasn't gotten up yet, I don't think. He's here at the feet of Jesus and, he's, and he still knows something's missing. And he says, but the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? He's incomplete and he knows it, but he can't put his finger on it because he's looking in the wrong place. He's looking on earth. He's looking in himself. He's looking at how can I elevate myself to be someone worthy of being accepted by God? There's no way to do that. So something's missing. Maybe he senses that he really doesn't have this meaning in life that he expected to have. Maybe he senses that he's really not picking up on God's presence. Maybe he was with some people who had God's presence with them. I don't know. But, but he's missing something. I think more likely he's just realizing that he's got this awful question in his mind. Is this all there is in life? Is this all there is? Isn't there something better than this? Really? I hear this grace stuff, but, but, but really, what do I have to do? How, do? how do I get hooked into this? So something's missing. But what he's been doing is he's deceived and he's been mimicking the outward behavior of holiness. He's all dressed up. He's mimicking the outward behavior. He thinks that outward behavior is embracing a relationship with God. But it's not. It feels good. It can be really exciting. You can have an experience. I'd like to launch some time about uh, how we do worship here at New Creation. And, and we don't have, this is fun. I mean, you guys kid me about it, and you should. But we don't have smoke machines. We don't have dancers. We don't have rappers. We don't have light shows. We don't have any of that utter nonsense. <laughs> it's kind of refreshing, isn't it? But, but why, why am I so hard on that? Because what we're trying to do, and I've been in meetings where they're saying, how do we create an experience for these people? Worship is not about creating experience for people. It may, there may be experience there. I'll bet when, when the fire came down from heaven and everybody had to run out of the temple when, and, and burn up those sacrifices that Solomon provided, that was quite an experience. I'll bet there was a woo-hoo moment for them there. However... That was not the point. What worship is built on, what worship is for, is coming and we as a church body and we as individuals are offering our love and adoration and respect and reverence to the living God. That's what worship is. This is why we have something simple. And we're not here to drown ourselves out with the instruments, however skilled and beautiful they may be. Does that mean we shouldn't have a concert? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Don't miss the point. Concerts are great. I've paid money for them. Some I regretted, but I have done that. (laughs) But but we went to one in in the Sacramento area. It was just horrible. But but we we regretted that one. Because the thing was, everybody was shut out. We were just spectators and watching something on a stage that none of us were involved in. That isn't worship. It's entertainment. Okay, entertainment's fine. But let's not call it worship. Did worship happen there? Probably some. Was it because of the stage? No. It's because somebody showed up with a heart and they gave that to the Lord. So we do things simple where we can hear each other sing. We can be in the presence of God together. That's how we worship here. Anyway. But the young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. He tells him what to do. That's, that's what this guy, this is this guy's currency. But then he says, come and follow me. 
It's the same offer. It's the same offer Peter got. Come, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. It's the same offer. We don't know this guy's name. We just know some descriptors. Uh, maybe, maybe he was young. I don't know. But he was young, or he was, he was a ruler. He was rich. This is about all we know about him. He got an offer from Jesus to come and join the twelve. Let that soak in a minute. Jesus didn't offer this to just anybody. He offered it to people he knew that would mold and conform themselves to him. And this guy, can you see how close this guy is to eternity? I think this is one of the saddest stories in the New Testament. He's right there. And Jesus takes him to the first commandment. Jesus has been setting him up. He's there. Are you going to listen to me? Here's what you've been doing. It's not working, is it? Jesus is a pretty good, pretty good therapist. Okay. You ready for this? Swallow hard, buddy, because here it comes. I want you to sell your stuff and get in line with the other guys. What are you going to do? The bus is here. We have a seat for you. It's going to leave. Are you going to get on the bus or not? Will you? I ask that question sometimes I'll be working with as, as a therapist and, and also as a, as a pastor. I work with people that I just don't know if I'm saved. How do I know if I'm saved? You know what? Well, I've sinned. I've done this. I've done that. And blah, 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 blah. So, okay. All right. All right. Uh, but, you know, they tell me they believe. Well, I don't have some litmus test. I can't put like a, a litmus paper in their, in their, in their, on their tongue and say, well, you know, it's this heavenly color, so you must be saved. There's no such thing. Boy, that'd make life easier sometime, wouldn't it? Especially in an election year. You talking Jesus? Here, stick out your tongue. I want to see this. There is no such thing. And I'll tell him this story. And I kind of want you to react to this story yourself, okay? And I'll tell him this. I'll say, okay, let's pretend. Just play with me. Just pretend with me. Jesus. It's really Jesus. Really is Jesus. He pulls up with a bus and he parks right in front of the building and he comes in and he walks right past me and he comes and stands in front of you. This is really Jesus. Have I said it's really Jesus enough yet? It's really Jesus. He comes in, he stands in front of you. He says, I have a bus. I'm leaving. There's a seat for you. Do you want to get on the bus? What did your heart just do? And I see these people who I think are really believers and they go, yeah. I've seen them shift forward in their chair. Yeah. I went on the bus. The others I'm worried about say, is this really Jesus? How do I know? Where is he going? The ones I think are real believers go, I don't care where he's going. It's Jesus in a bus. He wants me to go. I'm getting on the bus. I don't care where the bus goes. What did your heart do? It happens to me when I tell a story. <laughs> I want to get on the bus. I wish it was that simple. He's here. I'm out. Bye. <laughs> Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Don't follow your heritage. Don't follow your, your money. Don't follow your power. Don't follow your politics. Come and follow me. Get on the bus. It's going to leave. Get on the bus. Verse 22, but when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. He went away grieving. I, I think... I think Sometimes we react to people and we, we expect him to go off stridently. We expect him to go off arrogantly. Like, who do you think you are to tell me these things? But he doesn't. He doesn't. Because he is so close to eternity. His toes are right on the edge. The light of God is right there on his toenails. And he can't step in. He won't. This is heartbreaking. It's crushing. But we've seen this before in Scripture. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. This is not new. 
Hebrews chapter 12, picking up on verse 14. It says, Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness spring up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. That there be no, what? Immoral. We hear that. We skip over the next one. What's the next one? Godless man. Godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. Now, don't get your, your clauses mixed up here. He's not referring to he sought for repentance and God wouldn't give it to him. He sought for the blessing. Don't you have another blessing for me, Father? That's how the story goes, doesn't it? And he's grieving. He found no place for repentance. He wanted the blessing. He found no place for repentance. And then scripture labels him a godless man. Wow. I don't know that I can describe a greater tragedy. In Romans chapter 10, of course we have to have a verse out of Romans. Romans chapter 10. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, for the Jewish people, is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness. Do you remember what righteousness means? This is why it's so important to keep this in your head. Righteousness is not doing the right things and not doing the wrong things. Righteousness is a character trait. Is a character trait that comes from God. And it comes from God for being right with him, for being in relationship with him. He transforms us into righteousness. He made him who knows sin be sent on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You with me? So it's a character trait. For not knowing about God's righteousness, didn't know what he was like. Didn't know that he reaches out to others in love and mercy. Didn't know that. Didn't know that he was holy. They're treating it as if it's a transactional relationship. I give you this, you give me that back. But not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. Their own what? Righteousness. Their own character. Their, no, their own worthiness. This is what they're trying to do. Because they're trying to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. This is why they fell in the wilderness. This is why they never entered the promised land. The end of, of Hebrews chapter 3, it says, we see that they did not enter because of unbelief. What are you talking about? They saw the, they saw the miracles. They saw, the, they saw the, the destruction of Egypt. They saw the manna. They saw the pillar of fire. They saw the pillar of cloud. They saw the tabernacle. They saw the fire. They saw all this stuff. What do you mean they don't believe? Does that mean they didn't know it existed? That's not what they're talking about here. They did the same thing this young man chose to do. They looked, they saw, and they said, eh, don't want it. Just like Esau. No difference. Is this making sense? This is about a real relationship with the living God. It's not about go and do with a real relationship with him, with that as our foundation, then he will call us and show us what we will do. But we get the cart before the horse. And isn't that what Satan does? He reverses it. But Jesus didn't reject this man. Do you see that? He judged himself. John chapter 3, Jesus talking to Nicodemus, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, you know, maybe I should slow this down. I mean, if you, like you've heard me say, if you watch football, you know that verse, right? Because it's, it's out there on placards, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then he goes on to say, for the son of man did not come to judge, but to save the world. He who does not believe is judged already because he didn't, name the, didn't believe in the name of the the Son of God. They're judged already. 
And so they're saying, no, I think I'll stay where I am. Then he goes on to talk about people will come to the light because their heart is in God. They will come out of the dark. They won't stand with their toenails on that bright line between darkness and death and lostness and judgment. They won't stand on that line. They'll step across that line into the light and probably take a sigh of relief. I sure did. Have you? I know I'm preaching to the choir, but maybe there's somebody on the video that's watching this that maybe they haven't or they're thinking about it. Don't stay on the the back side of the line. Just take the step. Just take the step. And a lot of Christians are insecure about their faith. A lot, we just wonder, do I believe or do I think I believe? Is my, is my faith really genuine? And we get confused because we, we, we look at works-based stuff and transactional relationships like we have with everybody else. Why should God's relationship with me be any different than just something I give and he gives back? Because we look at it this way. We've misunderstood there's a couple of ways that we can, be, we can be comforted that our faith is real. Now, as fun as the bus story is, that's not really biblical, so maybe that's not so much help. But what he says in Romans chapter 5 is that we, we have this hope by this grace in which we stand. We have this salvation, this justification that he has accomplished for us. And then he says, and not only do we exult in our hope that we're, we're going to be with him, and all of what that entails. Not only that, but we exult in our tribulations because tribulation brings about what? Do you remember? And perseverance then brings... And per, what is perseverance? Real quick. It's hanging in there, right? It's tenacity. Long-suffering. Great, great. It's hanging... I love that word. We don't use it anymore. But, but we get it, don't we? I'm hanging in. This is tough. But my fingernails are dug in. I'm not letting go. Life throws some really bumpy things at us, and it hurts. But I'm not walking away from Jesus. None of this even even scratches that. You know, you ask them, like, things things are tough right now, and they're in a lot of pain, or or there are a lot of suffering, health problems, or financial problems, or whatever the problems may be. And you ask them about, so is this going to compromise your faith? And they'll look look at you like you got three heads. What is wrong with you? Sure this hard. Sure this sucks. I don't know what God is doing, but... I'm not going anywhere. I'm on the bus. I got a seat. I got a ticket. So just get out of my way. I'm walking with Jesus. <laughs> so if we're looking at the experiences we have and we see the, in, the enduring quality of our faith, if we see that, then there's perseverance. And perseverance then says, I'm the real deal. I have proven character tested well I may not be perfect but I'm not walking away I don't even understand what that would be I'm just walking with Jesus well then that's real faith but while you're waiting for that I think Dr. Mitchell who was kind of a mentor at some distance for me but Dr. Mitchell founded Multnomah School of the Bible now Multnomah University Um, he would advise you to do two things. I really love what he said. There's two prayers you can always ask God and he will always answer. You ready for this? Do you want to see prayers answered? Ask for these two things. There's two things. One, you ask the Father to give you a love for Jesus. Ask the Father to give you a love for his Son. He will always answer that question. This helps us then engage with our emotions better. Ask the Father to give you love for the Savior and he will delight to give you that. Ask the Father to give you a love for the Scripture. And He will delight to give you that. You want prayers answered? Pray those two babies, and it'll show up. He may build it, because He doesn't like to microwave things for you. What He wants to do is put it in a crock pot and cook it up, or He wants to plant a seed and get it to grow like an oak. But He'll answer that. And what you'll see kind of accidental, He didn't say this, this is mine, But what you'll see kind of accidentally, when you begin to love Jesus like that and he begins to fill your heart with a love for the Savior, who else are you going to love? Everybody else. 
You want to see Jesus active in your life? You pray those two things. Anyway, Jesus said to the disciples, Truly, truly, I say to you, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished. How often do you hear the word very in Scripture? See, in Hebrew, they don't do that. They build those intensifiers into the, into the verb. These guys, are, they're, they're speaking Aramaic probably, but they're, they're going to think this way. This is how they're built, right? This is how they talk. And so they're not going to use very... very these guys are stunned. They're speechless. What? It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And there's this stuff about the, the, the gate in Jerusalem. Let me skip that. It's just, just distraction. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? Why are they thinking this way? Because they're used to giving the rich people deference because they believe that if you were rich, it's because you're blessed by God. This is not an idea that's gone away. That has nothing to do with it. God raises up and he brings down whoever he wishes. And so to us, from our perspective, because we can't figure out what's really going on in heaven, it seems kind of random from our perspective. We can't treat it as a transactional relationship. If I do this, then God's going to give me more. It doesn't work like that. But they're looking, they're looking at rich guys who could come into the temple and they could offer all these sacrifices. Poor people couldn't do that as well. Is this making sense? So if, if you were one of those guys from that perspective, wouldn't you see the rich guys can afford all these sacrifices? Well, they must have an inside road to God because they got all this money. You with me on this? This is what they're thinking. This is what they've always thought. Who are the guys on the top of the pile? The rich guys, the educated guys. And they're the ones in the temple all the time. Why? Because they have time. They're not subsistence farmers. Those guys don't have time for this. They don't have resources for this. Sure, sure, sure. Their allowance is made for, for poor people and their sacrifices. But, I mean, really. The, the, the good stuff is the, the bulls and the goats, right? Not the turtle doves. So they're very astonished. So they, they can't see who can be saved. I want to deal with one more thing here. I'm going to kind of read these verses because we're, we're getting up to the time here. But look at Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 15. It's, it's a stunning verse. But it's, it's, it's a corker. And it seems, it's one of those things that seems like really, really simplistic on the surface. But it's not. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 15. The rich man's wealth is his fortress. The ruin of the poor is their poverty. Doesn't it seem kind of redundant? The ruin of the poor is their poverty? Well, of course, because they don't have anything. They don't have resources. It's not what it's getting at. Let's, let's reframe this. Who is your fortress supposed to be? What does it mean? Right. Whether you're rich or poor, Right. Your fortress is supposed to be God. My rock, my fortress, right? David, wealthy as he was, knew all of this. David had so much gold that silver stopped being worth, any, worth anything. This is a rich guy. And so this is not a statement about, well, rich guys, you know, they're, they're safe in their fortress of their wealth, but poor people suffer. We know that's true. That's not what this is getting at. What Solomon calls the riddles of the wise The rich man's wealth is his fortress. The ruin of the poor. The ruin of the poor. So what this does, when we see the ruin of the poor is their poverty, see the rich are apathetic about the warning to flee from the wrath to come because they live in their fortress. Ah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine, I'm good. And we live in a very apathetic age of the church because we're all so much richer. We don't take these things seriously. But the ruin of the poor, it's not their economic status. The ruin of the poor is they have this attitude that I can't count on God. He's not there for me. I'm a victim. Do we hear that in our society today? That's what this verse is talking about. It's resenting God over their plight as if God owes them or he doesn't care about them. It's this victim mentality. So Jesus is not saying that we must be poor. He's not saying we must be poor. He's not saying that being rich is a death sentence. Even though it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, 
than for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying that our attitude toward wealth affects our attitude toward God. It can take you in any direction. Well, I know that this is a gift from God. I'm going to use it for his glory. Okay, then you're not about the wealth. But it can be, I'm okay, I'm comfortable, I'm stable. Yeah, I'll, I'll deal with that later. And we put it off. And our toes are right there on the edge of eternity. And the poor can go the other way. They can resent it. You might remember liberation theology, which I don't have to go into, time to go into right now. But it was all about we are victims, and it's, it's the man, it's the establishment, they have abused us. And so God owes us. It's our time to rise up and throw them off, the evil oppressors. And they committed heinous acts in the name of Jesus. I'm going to pick this up. I'll just cover this one last verse, and we'll pick up verse 27 next week, because this is a two-parter. I forgot to warn you about that part. So you'll get out of here before the streetlights come on. Verse 26, and looking at them. Now turn on your TV here. See Jesus and looking at them. Well, who can be saved then? And looking at them. He, he almost, the way G. Campbell Morton would put it, this, he rested them. They froze. You know how your mom had that look? <laughs> right? Some of you moms have that look. That you can, my, my daughter's going, mm-hmm, yep, yep, watch me. <laughs> this look and he freezes them because he wants them to get this Jesus said to them to answer their question then who can be saved if the people in the transactional relationship that can give a lot to God if, if, if they're not getting saved then who gets saved that's a good question isn't it and so looking, Jesus captures this moment. He's preparing them for his journey to the cross and he captures this one moment and he says, with men, with people, this is impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. It's humanly impossible to save yourself but here you are. All you bus riders, here you are. You and me. We may struggle. Jairus said, I believe, help my unbelief. We may struggle. Jesus didn't say we wouldn't struggle. With people, this is impossible. But with God, there are no limits. If you need to be saved, if you are willing to step into the light, even a little, Jesus will show up for you. That's why we're sitting here, isn't it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this glimpse into the heart of a troubled man. And we know there are many people in our, in our town, and our friends, even other churches, even maybe this church, on video, whose heart is troubled because they don't know how to connect with God. And we pray for all of them. Call us to pray, Lord. Call us to pray for people that, that need to know you, our friends, people that come and visit us that may not know you. Some of them, I don't think, do, but they're looking. Lord, use us in a way to help them step into the light to be with us as they see us love them, they will know that love comes from the Savior. Call us to love Jesus. Call us to love your scripture. So there'll be no other explanation for us except that Jesus lives and is alive in us. The living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we thank you for this time that we've had to look into your word. As we, we finish these thoughts next week, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.